Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Pandemic Parenting, Co-Parenting, and Single Parenting Edition. My name is Victoria Burek, and I'm the digital content producer for Pandemic Parenting. We are so excited to have you all joining with us tonight. This webinar is part of our bi-weekly Pandemic Parenting Exchange Series, and in each of these webinars, our panelists offer science-based knowledge, experience, and resources to help you and your family cope during the pandemic. To stay up to date on our latest webinars, you can follow us on social media and subscribe to our email list. With that, I will introduce our two co-founders. Dr. Amanda Zalahowski is a clinical and forensic psychologist and associate professor of psychology at Valparaiso University. And Dr. Lindsay Malloy is a developmental and forensic psychologist and an associate professor at Ontario Tech University. You can read more about them and their backgrounds on our website. With that, I'll turn it over to Amanda. Thank you very much, Victoria. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Uh, I want to just give you a little bit of background for why Lindsay and I wanted to have this conversation on this topic um, tonight. So part of the reason is, you know, we've been, this is our uh, ninth pandemic parenting webinar, believe it or not, in, in only about four months. And what we have noticed is that you know, missing from the conversation have been the unique sort of struggles and challenges of single parents and those involved in co-parenting throughout the pandemic. So we felt it was really important and, and long overdue to shine a big spotlight um, on all of the single parents and those experiencing co-parenting right now um, throughout COVID-19 because the challenges are quite different. And so we're really hoping to highlight a number of those challenges and, and share some thoughts and resources and expertise tonight to help you in the way that your situation, again, might look different than um, the situation of other parents. So I want to introduce our moderator tonight. We always have a moderator for these webinars. For those of you joining us for the first time, it's usually a, stu a graduate student, an early career professional, um, in part because we really want to use this opportunity to amplify emerging scholars in the field and just introduce you to lots of the, the rising stars um, that you'll be hearing a lot from in, in years to come. So we're really excited about tonight's moderator, Dr. Sarah Appleby. Dr. Appleby is an assistant professor of psychology at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. Her research focuses primarily on legal decision-making. She's a single mother of a 13-month-old son and two high-energy rescue dogs. So we're really excited to have Sarah with us uh, tonight. So Sarah, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Amanda. I am really excited to be here as well. I, um, like most of you, have noticed that um, my situation feels left out of a lot of the conversations about try this tip or how's this going. And um, so I'm really excited to be here moderating this. Um, so for those of you that maybe this is your first time tuning in, um, how these webinars typically work is we I'll introduce our two guests tonight and then there will be a, um, a Q&A with the guests. Some of these questions will be ones that um, have been submitted beforehand. Um, and then we'll open it up um, towards the end for Q&A from the, um, the chat. So if you have questions as we go along, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, and we will um, work to answer some of those towards the end. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce Dr. Christina Grange. Dr. Christina M. Grange is a clinical psychologist and owner of the Fern Center for Life in Atlanta, Georgia. She is also an associate professor of psychology at Clayton State University. Her clinical training focused on the well being and optimal development of young people in the context of their families. Her recent research and clinical work have evolved to focus on how to best support African American unmarried parents working to successfully co parent their child or children. Um, and we will have links on the website to some of her recent writings related to her work. Um, also joining us tonight is Dr. John Moran. Um, we're going to call him Jack. Um, he is a licensed forensic and clinical psychologist with 35 years of experience serving as a court appointed expert. He is on the board of directors of Overcoming Barriers Incorporated and served as clinical director of three Overcoming Barriers residential family camps. He organizes multi-day intensive interventions for families responding to parent-child contact problems. He's the author of two books, Overcoming the Co-Parenting Trap, Essential Skills When a Child Resists a Parent, and Overcoming the Alienation Crisis, 
33 Co-Parenting Solutions, which is an Amazon number one bestseller. He's authored a number of articles and chapters for professional publications and provides training to behavioral health professionals, attorneys, and judges um, at local, regional, and national conferences. Um, and we'll have more information about him and I assume links to his books up on the website as well. Um, so I want to start, um, I'm going to start with you, Christina, um, just kind of if you could briefly share kind of what you do and in general, and what have you noticed in your work with parents during the pandemic? And then Jack, I'll have you answer the same question. Thanks, Sarah. Um, generally speaking, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm here in Atlanta. And my work originally started with children. I'm trained to work with children um, and adolescents. And in that work, I kind of constantly was coming in contact with young people living in the context of diverse family structures. And that naturally led me to working with single parents and oftentimes people who were trying to figure out the best way to create a healthy context for their child, which involved the other parent. And so that's how I became more involved in co-parenting work and getting integrated into that type of research. I've noticed a few things with the pandemic. Um, one is I operate from a strength-oriented perspective. So I want to highlight that most parents are doing better than they thought they might be doing. And I think that's something to kind of recognize and celebrate their children are alive. They um, are making it through this, this academic experience, whether we call it homeschooling or remote learning, virtual. So parents are doing better than they expected to. But at the same time, the average parent wasn't expecting to ever spend this much time with their child, who they love dearly, I'm sure, as I love my own, but that just wasn't something that was expected. So it's been a big adjustment and that adjustment varies depending on the level of support the parents have, the developmental stage that the child is in, and obviously the type of connection there is with the co-parent. With that being said, it makes sense that if they're, from what I've seen, systems that have been created have naturally been thrown off because co-parents have had to adjust and work together in a way that in some cases, they thought they wouldn't have to adjust, right? They thought we have a rhythm, we have a plan and we're gonna follow it. And COVID, like with many other things in our life, COVID-19 has given the opportunity and the challenge for us to, to be flexible in ways that we just didn't thought, didn't think that we would, we would have to be. And so adapting and flexibility have been key across the child, the parent and, and other family members. And our job is to support that. Great. Jack, how about you? Well, first, I want to thank you for inviting me to give me the opportunity to participate. This is an exciting project, and uh, it's a needed project, so that's it's really excellent to be here. Well, I've been uh, you know working with families for more than thirty years, and so you know, different family problems ranging from relationship issues just between the adults, but more recently between parents and children. And for the last 20 years or so, I've been involved with a lot of family court cases. And so those are difficult for obviously the parents of, are struggling in a significant way. And that oftentimes the kids get caught up in the struggle. And recently we've been experiencing the surge of phenomenon, sometimes called parent-child contact problems, sometimes referred to as alienation. Uh, sometimes referred to as resist refuse dynamics. It, it can present itself in a lot of different ways. But at the heart of it all is co-parents who are really doing their level best to protect their children, to provide a safe family environment for the children, but they're just struggling with one another in a mighty way. And so that of course spills over into the kids in some way. And then you take, you know, a co-parents who are vulnerable, let's say, to conflict, and you add on top of that the COVID pandemic, and suddenly they've, you know, they're overwhelmed, and it's a very difficult situation for them, and uh, complicates things enormously. I'm afraid. So I work with those problems, trying to help them out, um, and that's that's my current focus. Great. Um, so I. Um... 
as Amanda said, I'm a single mom and um, I recognize that single moms, people become single moms in a, through a lot of different life circumstances. Um, some people are what we call single moms by choice. Some people have had partners in the past. Um, and I was wondering um, how, how have you guys seen um, this pandemic unfold differently for single parents um, that maybe have always been single compared to people who have had a partner helping them in the past? Um, have you noticed a difference? Um, has this come up in your work at all? Um, maybe I'll start back with you, Christina. Thanks, Sarah. I think um, it's a really important question. And I think you're right that people who are parenting in a variety of ways, but as the main adult in their household, oftentimes are left out of the conversation. And one of the things thinking about single parents who are primarily responsible for the child, kind of putting co-parenting to the side a little bit that I found that's been helpful um, is that women, particularly, because I work with a lot of women respecting that there are single fathers as well. So parents are finding ways to extend their network, even though they can't be in physical contact. But it's very difficult because, again, you think you have a system set up, especially if you're a non traditional family, you know, if you will, as a single parent, a co parenting family. And that that system takes work to set up when you're in a non-traditional situation. And so it definitely, if you had childcare, like shared child caring, that might've been a thing. Um, people who you regularly were able to meet with and debrief maybe over a play date, that sort of thing. Those have all been kind of tossed to the side. So I found that parents have actually utilized the resource online because there's been even more connection through connecting through social social media mechanisms. And so more groups for diversity in parenting, more groups for specifically co-parenting or specifically single parenting have been a resource. I also have supported parents who are parenting alone in their household, but they have a co-parent and finding unique ways to utilize, if not that co-parent, then other family resources, even if they can't be who they were originally. And that's been very helpful to families to realize that we can make a lot of things work with FaceTime. <laughs> it's not quite supervision in terms of you can't leave the house, but maybe this person can go over spelling words, right? One less thing for you to have to do. And this person could be a grandparent, can be a co-parent, can be a neighbor, whoever wants to join us in this virtual village can participate. And that's been a fun thing because kids do get tired of, if we can say that, um, listening to their parents. So if someone else says the same thing, it's new, right? So that's been nice to utilize that, that resource in a different way, in a different way and to really empower parents. But it's, it's a tricky adjustment because I think it can just feel very lonely. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a really kind of creative idea. Um, and I just want to echo that. I see a lot of people saying, oh, I'm getting off social media, or, you know, my mom will say, you spend too much time on social media. And I'm like, it's me and a 13 month old kid <laughs> in this house. Like, I, social media is all I got right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I've got my Facebook groups and I've got for, you know, moms and academics and those kinds of things. Like, that's my lifeline right now. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I definitely want to jump in and kind of recommend that, you know, see if you can find your village on online, because I think that has really been what's been pulling me through this um, pandemic. Um, we, I just wanted to add one thing to that. So we, we've had a lot of amazing conversations in these webinars about this village, right? And I, I love the way you phrased it, Christina, like what is your virtual village and how can you recreate aspects of that or, or get creative about it? And it was making me think, you know, Sarah, when you brought up, especially single parents, you know, by choice or, or whatever the circumstance might be that there isn't another parent there. Like one of the things I've noticed for me in, in the worst moments or the worst days of the pandemic is the ability to sort of debrief or do that post-game analysis, you know, with my partner at the end of the day has been critical for our ability to, to manage. So with single parent friends, that's a conversation and a recommendation I've 
suggested is, you know, we, you got to find, and I'll be that person for you if you need it, but you've got to find somebody at the end of the day to sort of do that debrief, do that, you know, because tomorrow's a new day and there are different ways to sort of strategize, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to, you know, find those people in my virtual village to help in these different ways? Because when you are overwhelmed in the ways that you're describing, Sarah, you lose your ability to, to generate those creative solutions. So having your sort of single parent partner, you know, that you could also just sort of check in with and say, help me think this through because I am exhausted and I don't know how to do this differently or I don't know who to reach out to for help in this way, um, I think has been really helpful for people just to have somebody else to help you kind of get out of your head and your emotions and think it through. Yeah. yeah, I would join in with that. I, I don't see whether there's an option to that, that a single parent must be in a position where their, you know, their resource pool has just shrunk enormously. Their responsibility load has just gone up a lot. And so they're bound to feel both some identity confusion and, you know, get self-critical and all the other kinds of negative chatter that happens when we're feeling overwhelmed in those kinds of circumstances. And so, you know, online, you know, is, is it, provides an opportunity for creative solution, but it also provides that opportunity for support and for, you know, for helping you re-get your bearings at the end of the day. So by all means, I echo what, uh, what's been said. Um, so while we're talking about single parents, I just kind of want to build on this and then we'll um, talk co-parenting again a little bit. Um, similarly, um, a lot of single parents that um, I talk to, or if you read stories about, you know, profiles of single parents, um, self-care is the first thing to go. Um, because, you know, if I have an extra 30 minutes or an hour, I'm not going to go run, which is what I want to do. I'm, I've got to clean the kitchen or, you know, something like that. Um, and so, I'll start with Jack this time. Um, do you have any advice on how single parents can avoid um, burnout um, or, um, you know, just kind of feeling overwhelmed, kind of building on this when, um, or, you know, advice about how to kind of maybe find some time for self-care. And I know Lindsay recently wrote a great little blog post about how we don't have to always think about self-care as like yoga and bubble baths. Um, and so if she wants to chime in as well, um, she can. And I'm sure Victoria will put the link on um, on the website. Well, I was, in, I was in line at Trader Joe's once and the person in front of me was taking a long time. And the cashier, finally it was my turn, and the cashier said, Jay, I'm sorry you had to wait so long. I said, that's okay, I've been trying to work on my patience, on being more patient. And she responded to me, you know, I decided I needed to, be, to work on being more patient too. And so I asked God to help me learn to be more patient. That was a mistake. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, what can you do when you're when you're when you, the things that you enjoy doing are no longer available to you? When the ways in which you renew yourself are no longer there, and and in which you know you're confronted with an endless series of tasks and obligations with very little relief in sight, and I know sure you can you know, try and learn medic medic meditation on the on, very quickly and things like that, but I think it has a lot to do with gentle self talk and compassion for the self and learning to really sit down and quickly be able to kind of go inside yourself, you know, deeply inside yourself, inside your heart, if you will, and just say, hey, you know, let's be nice to me for, for 10 minutes here because this is really hard. And, and giving yourself a lot of that kind of internal massaging, if you will. That's great. Um, that's, that's a great that's term, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got, yeah, the blog you're talking about, I. I, I think I, I wanted to title it like I hate self care or something like that. <laughs> or I hate I should say I hate the term self care. Um, really hate the term. I just don't like the solution of everything that people are telling you when you're stressed out as a parent during a global pandemic is like oh you just need more self care. And so that was sort of what it was about and me trying to reconceptualize in my own head well what is self care? It doesn't have to be going for a run or you know, these other things that we might not have time for and thinking about it more is like maybe for me, self-care right now is saying no. 
maybe that's the way I'm, you know, protecting myself and, and caring for myself is saying no to some things usually at work, you know, that I would have said yes to a year ago, but now I just don't have the bandwidth for, or maybe it's, you know, lower, lowering my expectations of what I can accomplish in a day. And so that has helped me just rethink self-care in my own head and say like, yeah, I can focus on that if I think about it in a different way. And I want to just add to that if I can, Sarah. Yeah, go but for it. But it might also um, depend what it looks like may vary even in simplicity based on your child's age. Mm -hmm. And I think of it like children change so fast, but we don't. So the thing that I was doing two years ago, I still want to do that thing, but maybe I can't do that thing because now you as the child, you're a whole different person. Now I got to adjust. So I think that, you know, it's different. So like with 13 months, a young child, perhaps self-care might be able to be playing with the child or being able to exercise while they're doing something simple. If you want to exercise, stretch. I couldn't really read when mine was that young. I still can't really read for pleasure around her. But, um, you know, stretching or something like that, if you need to do something with your body a little bit, I mean, I brought my child into the shower area so that I could have a little bit more of an extended shower, right? Um, just little moments of self-care versus maybe self-care experiences. And then as they're getting older, like it's seven now, mine is seven, I can say, okay, I'm going to be alone for 10 minutes. <laughs> and I want to show her that that's okay mm -hmm. to tell somebody that I need to be alone, right? Um, taking a breath for, for me and for a lot of the families that I work with, because you can do it anywhere. To me, being able to slow down, even if you're not gonna do full-blown yoga, like was stated, and take some breaths um, can be really helpful in kind of calming down literally our physiological symptom. And again, clues to or those in our environment that I need a moment. <laughs> so those non-verbals can really be helpful. And then as you get to have teenagers, my fantasy is that you can do a little bit more self-care, but I think the parents of teenagers would say no. It doesn't necessarily <laughs> get easy or as they're teenagers, but you can do it in different ways. So that if you want to take a walk and you're comfortable leaving your children at home because they're older, that's something that can happen. Or if you want to say, I'm going to read this book for 10 minutes, that can happen a little bit more. So I appreciate Lindsay's point. I kind of took from what Lindsay said, the simplicity of it. It can be a simple thing that's an act of love to yourself. Yeah, Plus, we have to believe, we have to believe that it gets easier when they're teenagers. Otherwise, we just won't make it to that <laughs> point. <laughs> like, that's my thing. So yeah. to that. there's been some great suggestions in, in the chat too, where it seems like for a lot of people kind of related to what several of you have said, it's also just about letting things go that like, you know what, if my kid misses the Zoom session today with his class, like, it's fine if we don't do this assignment, you know, if I don't get to these different housekeeping tasks, like it's just letting go that that is self-care too, of not letting yourself feel the guilt and reminding yourself that it's okay. Um, and I've seen a couple of examples that have been great too around advocating for yourself, you know, whether that's at work or like you were just saying, Christina, sometimes it's even advocating for yourself with your kids. Like I just need 10 minutes. Okay. Cause this is what mom needs right now to just kind of rejuvenate. So I just need 10 minutes. Well, that's advocating for yourself. And I think, like you said, it's, it's modeling for your kids. Sometimes we need to be able to advocate for what we need. Um, so, and I appreciate that, that Gory is telling us in the chat that it, it will get better as kids grow up. So this is <laughs> hope for all. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's circle back to our co-parents for a minute. Um, this is something that, um, I've actually been thinking about, so my, um, my parents divorced when I was young. And um, when I talked to my dad, his perception of the risk and the risks that he's taking are, are scary to me. Like, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, we will see you later. You know, whereas my mom and I were on the same page um, and I'm an adult and I can tell my dad, like, I, you're too risky for me. We'll, you know, let's touch base later. Um, but what about how can parents who, you know, have younger children navigate um, risk management, social bubbles, those kinds of things when maybe one parent disagrees about, um, 
you know, how risky COVID is or how many risks we should take. I think there's a lot to be said about it. Um, in terms of navigating risk, I think it's true, your, your point about your parents, it's like that with all of our family because yeah. we're all different. And I think of COVID risk, not as categorical, like you're risky or not, mm -hmm. but there's a spectrum here of risk. So I encourage people to not in a way demonize what other people are doing, but to understand that people are kind of operating from their own frame. So one of the things that I support parents with is recognizing that we fundamentally love our children. So we can probably agree on that. Um, but we might not understand how the other person is making decisions. So how can we work towards understanding, right? We know the love is there. We hope the trust is there, but in co-parenting that can be tricky, but we can work to understanding how you're making decisions. And even though you may make decisions that are different from my decisions, the hope is that if I can understand your perspective better, I can accept it, even if I don't agree with it. And so if you're taking the children to a birthday party, I might not be taking a child to a birthday party. That's something that, you know, it's a simple thing that I've seen come up. And A, how have we both prepared our children for the experience at the birthday party? And B, what do I need to do as a parent if I'm receiving the child when they come back to mitigate some of the risks they might've experienced? Something else that's been recommended is that if a parent is really concerned, really stressed out about it, and yeah, afraid even, to really support the co-parent or for the co-parent to keep in mind that that fear may be significant enough, depending on what the activity is, to warrant changing your perspective. Because you're in this thing for the long haul. We're in COVID-19 space longer than we thought we would be. And we don't know how much longer we're gonna be here. So maintaining that relationship is important. But I know Jack, you probably have some things to say about that too. Well, I, the most important thing I have to say is what you just said, and that is maintaining the co-parenting relationship is the critical factor that, um, you know, there's there's lots of preventives, I guess, that can be done in order to, to maintain it. And that might include simply uh, you know, share it, being open about what's going on. So it's not only talking about what your practices are and what your rationale is for it and trying to you know, develop some understanding as a basis for you know, mutual respect and acceptance, but also be sharing, be sh being sure to inform the other parent if, if there's an incident, if there was an exposure or contact that they, the other parent would probably want to be aware of. And so trying, you know, hiding those things can, you know, as they say, is it's not what you do that gets you in the most trouble. It's, it's covering up what you do that gets you in the big trouble. So, you know, trying to extend the courtesy of the other parent of really being transparent about it all. And, um, you know, in the cases that I'm involved in, unfortunately, often involve parents concluding that it's not safe for the children to go over. And so wanting to try and have them not go over to the other, the other parent's house according to the, the parenting time schedule. I think that the courts are uniform in saying that COVID does not change the parenting time mm -hmm. schedule and that you, you know, you're required to comply with the parenting time schedule. And so if the parents get into a really bad disagreement, then I think they have to try and find a third party to talk to take that to and to talk it through with. That you know, the third party, you know, it might be a, a, a pediatrician about, well, is that really unreasonably you know, unreasonable exposure, or is that just you know, more a matter of, of uh, comfort level with the amount of exposure that's there. A family therapist or psych, you know, any behavioral health professional might be able to help with that. But it's just critical to not let it become an impasse that goes unresolved and somebody blows up and it, it gets ugly because those kinds of things, they just, you know, they mount up and they mount up and they mount up. The, another point related to that is that if it does become an unfortunate incident, then everybody needs to try and repair the relationship. It's not okay to just say, well, there he is doing that again, or there she is doing that again. But rather recognize that, that your children need a really safe, loving, comfortable environment in both homes and feel comfortable going back and forth between the two homes. And so, you know, apologies will go a long ways towards repairing the damage that can happen when, um, you know, tempers flare or something unfortunate is said. 
Uh, I think one of the most challenging things in these co-parenting dynamics um, is, is sort of back to also what Christina said in the very beginning around, it's so hard to get to these agreements to begin with, right? When wow. you have parents in deep conflict, you know, and especially in the extreme cases like you're talking about, Jack, that it was hard enough for us to get there. We finally got there. And so we have this agreement, it's working and now you're, and now it has to change. And so the tough thing with the pandemic is how much things have constantly changed. And so we have to keep going back to the drawing table and, and when it was hard enough for us to come to a decision to begin with. And this goes for, you know, married parents too, parents that are supposedly perfectly getting along, right? right. It, it, we have to keep going back and making these decisions on, on a daily basis, if not hourly basis sometimes. Right. So I think one of the, the challenging things for, for co-parenting dynamics is also recognizing like, hey, our plan worked until it doesn't, okay? So we agreed on this, this is what made sense, but then this changed in the kid's mm -hmm. school or then this changed in, in our childcare situation or whatever, or with my work. And yeah. so that worked, but now it's not going to this week. So let's go back and re kind of negotiate this. And it's doing that often and constantly that I, I think is partly what's making this so challenging. Yeah. Well, sometimes it, you know, sort of the common enemy can draw the co-parents together and that though they were struggling before this like okay we have got to really pull together here and they're able to do that and but uh, there's no question you know negotiating the agreements is the key term you're at the negotiating table and you have to stay at the negotiating table and be creative and be flexible and make compromises and give peacemaking gestures that signal your good intention that signal your recognition of the other party's good intention and everybody's acting with good faith there's no bad actors here we're just really trying to hash this out as best we can until until finally something has come up with maybe it's a compromise you know, oftentimes it's a compromise okay and i you know as they say can you hold your nose and and swallow that solution maybe you can maybe you have to say well i, I hate to do it i'm not in your mind you're saying i hate to do it i don't know that i really trust this person that much that if i give in here and I'm going to get reciprocated later on, but it's it's a circumstance where being flexible and making concessions can pay can pay off well in the long run. Do y'all have advice for um, the children that? So we're talking about the parents and negotiating and renegotiating, but I imagine that you know the children are used to the routine, um, and then not only has their school closed down, maybe they're in and out of school because of, you know, uh, cases. And now their whole parent, you know, they're, I spend these days with mom and these days with dad, it might be changing because of, you know, having to renegotiate, um, you know, maybe, maybe one of the parents is an essential worker. Um, and so that, you know, necessitates changing the co-parent agreement. Um, how can parents help their kids cope with maybe the loss of time with one parent or just the, the changing of the schedule along with the rest of all of the change that they're having to deal with? Well, I think first off, yeah, you want to give the child a voice and really encourage them to, uh, to talk about what it's like for them. And I think that sometimes the parents have to recognize that kids really don't have the vocabulary or the concepts that they need to talk about these things sometimes. And so it's not like, you know, so the questions need to be more of a multiple choice question or maybe even leading questions, if you will, like, you know, well, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how difficult is this for you that, you know, you, we keep changing your schedule every other week because dad has to you know, keep going into the hospital or whatever, mom has to keep going into the hospital. And to, um, you know, I think that to give them that voice and then to give them support and to try and help them to label their emotions and understand what their emotions are, get the big picture of, you know, this is, this is, you know, this is stress, you're dealing with stress, this is what it's like to deal with stress, you've got all this uncertainty. So trying to give them support as best we can, I guess try, you know, cutting them slack, giving them some extra time, rewarding them, giving them more downtime to recover. And, and uh, you know, what do we all need when we're stressed? We need a little bit of, of support. We need something to soothe our systems. And so offering that to the kids as well. Christina, do you have anything you wanna add? Um, I think the point that Jack made in terms of giving them, helping them with their vocabulary is really important. 
and allowing them to utilize that as much as possible. And one way we can support that is by modeling it for them. Um, this being able to say, as Jack mentioned, that I'm stressed or at the end of the night having rituals, because even though they're transitioning to different homes, the rituals or the routines in the homes can stay the same. Another thing that's helpful with young people is because especially in a situation like this, they may feel like there's a lot of spaces where they don't have control, giving them a heads up might also help. This is what we anticipate to be the change. This is how we anticipate this to be changing. Um, allowing them to then ask questions about that change can be very empowering so that they don't always have to feel like this is something that's being done to them. So that's something that I think is pretty important. And within that, we can, as they receive information, again, support their ability to communicate about what they think. And I give them the space to articulate what those different emotions may be. And this may actually be something visual that parents can have around. Because as parents, we struggle with articulating our emotions sometimes too. And so what do these different feelings look like? How do you know when you're off? especially because stress can cause so many different types of emotions to kind of be aggravated, if you will. And so then to at least recognize when they're stressed can be pretty important. And I just don't think a lot of times kids say have, the, have used their voice because maybe they think they're not supposed to. Then that's just not something that, that is acceptable because they're just kids and they should be fine. But if we give them that space, I find that they're possibly going to get pretty good at using it. And that's something that we want to encourage. Yeah, space in, in these moments, even little of control, like we know anytime kids are experiencing crises, you know, or, or traumatic situations, traumatic stress in some of these extreme cases, like you referenced, it's a loss of control. And there's so little they can control right now, whether it's moving between homes, whether it's whether, you know, they're back in school or not, who they can see and not see. So when there are these little ways you can give back control that might just be exactly like you were saying in their routines, you know, that, okay, do you want to read your bedtime story first or do you want to brush your teeth first? Like, mm -hmm. should we, you know, clean up the room first or should we have a snack first? It's just these little opportunities that they have, no matter what age they are, to exercise a little bit of control, have some control over their day-to-day -day functioning, I think can also go a long way. It's about time to start um, taking some questions from the um, Q&A and some questions that you guys, um, some of these questions were submitted beforehand. One of the audience questions that was submitted beforehand, um, Amy in Missouri asked, um, she said she remembered seeing an article about divorce rates spiking in China mm -hmm. after the initial lockdown. Um, and, you know, that's not surprising. So we're people who have partners are spending a lot more time with their partners than they ever have before and maybe ever planned to. And um, what um, some of these people may have decided to transition to co-parent. Um, what about, um, is there any advice that you can give parents or parents to help with their children if people do decide to transition to co-parenting in the middle of the pandemic. There wasn't a co-parenting situation before, um, but starting in the middle of all of this, now mom and dad are not, or mom and mom or dad and dad are not going to be living together anymore. We've all thought about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I won't put Amanda on the spot, but you know, it's, it's hard not to at least, you know, have that cross your mind. Okay, okay, <laughs> you, that thought has never crossed my mind. Okay. <laughs> Putting the kids it, up for adoption. Made, right? made, <laughs> I, 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 What's she talking about? <laughs> Um, All sorts of solutions have come to mind during this uh, <laughs> during this time. <laughs> but um, I think one thing is so much. I feel like that's such a such a big question. It's a big question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one thing I think about is that we are kind of in a space that the world that we nobody we know has really been in before. Mm -hmm. So nothing you do now has to be permanent. Just, just know that if you want to take space, 
somebody you know has a trusted Airbnb or however they're going to do that space making process, you can do that without feeling like this is a final situation. If you're if you're separating mm-hmm. to to be in other households before an official divorce, right? right. So mm-hmm. I feel like there are levels to this separation right. process, right? Um, and I would I would hope that well, and people were at different stages when COVID started. People were out the door in March, so they're like, right. "I'm stuck here now." Mm-hmm. Wow! Oh, right. Yeah, there right. are there are people that were maybe about to leave, but then mm-hmm. decided not to separate because they needed to have the other person around to help with co-parenting, and that is mm-hmm. I've heard you know yeah. that as well. Yeah, and I've that- even read about people who've moved back in together, like you know, people who've been divorced for maybe years and moved back in and as mm-hmm. a way to create kind of a um you know a safe quarantine type yeah system so it is a big question but there's a couple of thoughts to share one is that if you're having that kind of trouble that and you're hopeless that try and limit your conversations to about the kids or about whatever it might be to 20 minutes Mm -hmm. because chances are after 20 minutes it's just going to escalate and and it's going to get complicated things aren't going to work well beyond that even probably you need to to really bring a third party into the conversation because you're at a point where a lot of important plans need to be made quickly and you and you by virtue of separating you're demonstrating that you can't do that and so you need to bring in a third party whether you can agree on an attorney as a mediator if there's like a, a mediating attorney group in town and you can go to them and say hey we need to put together a plan that's going to get us through these first 60 days or 90 days or whatever it's going to take to get into court, that would be great. If you do get attorneys, just I would, by all means encourage you to find ones who emphasize collegiality rather than, you know, being attack dogs because, uh, you know, virtually all couples at the time that they separate, you know, they have a lot of hard feelings. And so it's difficult, it's difficult to accommodate one another. But it's, I think it's, it's also just critical that you come up well, go online, use online resources for co-parenting. There's different programs. The one that's most popular is called Our Family Wizard. You do all the calendaring there. You do all the communication through there. And that helps to settle things down quite a bit. That if you go to an organization like um, the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, I'm real active in that organization, afccorg.net, or is it net.org? I'm sorry, but it's the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts. They have a lot of resources for parents that are available there. Even you might be able to find, there's a, a communication guideline for parents who are separating and divorce. It can be handy for you. But you know, the critical thing is that this is a really difficult time for the kids and the kids are gonna have two basic questions. One is where am I gonna be sleeping and when am I gonna see my other parent? And so you wanna answer those questions real quickly and real effectively for them and not get into, I don't, I don't think he or she is safe and start to you know, do a withholding pattern that, uh, you know, obviously you wanna check what the laws are in your state, but most of the time now the courts are gonna look real hard and say, well, have you really made an effort to give the both, have you each made an effort to give the other parent frequent and meaningful access time with the children? If you haven't, then that's gonna look bad for you later on down the line. And I do want to add one point, kind of on the front side of the potential separation process. Um, I found that when people are thinking about parenting or co-parenting, it's helpful to think about the other person as a parent, not as their romantic partner. So who they are as a parent has the potential to be different from who they are as your romantic partner. And at the beginning, if this is happening during COVID, there's there's a lot going on. So keeping in mind that those are not the same people. Those are two very different roles. And the more we can start to, if we're gonna do the separation process, think of those people as different, possibly the better able people are and able to, in terms of managing their own emotions and understanding that the parent is different potentially from the romantic partner, or at least giving space to consider that possibility. Yeah, I would build on that a little and take it another step further, which is I you know, think of your co-parent as a business partner. Mm. You know, that the emotional, the emotional element between the two of you is now supposed to be taken down to the level where you're just negotiating the exchange of information, 
is necessary in order to, for each of you to execute your parenting responsibilities in the way that's the best for the kids. And that, you know, it, it, so it's really not an exaggeration to just say, okay, this is now a business partnership. They don't, they don't need to know what I think about them as a person anymore. And I don't need to know what they think about me as a person anymore. It's really just exchange of practical information. Okay, so our next question is from Shane. And I'm gonna throw this one to you, Jack, first. Um, how do you recommend um, people who are co-parenting across state lines um, with maybe border restrictions in place? There are some places where, you know, if you are coming a coming into X state, you have to quarantine or um, I don't know all the specific rules because we don't have them We're in the state that I'm in. Um, but I, I've heard that there are rules um, about, you know, crossing state lines and quarantine, et cetera. Um, and so how do you recommend co-parenting across state lines um, with border restrictions? And um, in conjunction with maybe a co-parent who is not necessarily following COVID guidelines, um, if that makes sense. Well, that's a tough situation for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, number one is to emphasize the importance of staying in compliance with the laws mm -hmm. and, the, and the court rulings. And so, you know, you can't violate state laws just you know, for parenting, you have to, parenting has to be subsumed under the state laws. And so that could mean a circumstance where you, you can't execute a parenting plan that was in existence before. For example, right now, as I understand it, my sister lives in Pennsylvania and that uh, you, you know, you have to either have, she tells me you have to either have a COVID test 72 hours before you enter Pennsylvania, or you have to be quarantined for 14 days before you come into the state. Well, if you have, you know, if, if the other parent lives in Delaware or something like that, how are you going to keep doing that twice a month? So, and, and, and you can't get to the courts because the courts are, you know, they are, their calendars are just so slowed down now. So that can be the kind of situation where the parenting plan has to be radically changed and that then, you know, the parents have to work extra hard to provide access to the parent online, you know, 24 you know, access, online access to the other parent whenever they want it or to require it. Because a lot of times the kids are like, it's not that important that I'm not seeing my other parent. You know, I'd rather be hanging out you know, online with my friends. And so then the parent has to say, no, it is important. And I'm you know, gonna insist that you do this every day or whatever, whatever the rituals become. But those are just very difficult situations where probably, unfortunately, you know, if it's at all possible, you have to, you have to get the legal authorities involved, the attorneys, to try and help to negotiate that whatever to whatever extent you can. Okay, um, this next question is from Julie and I'm gonna direct it to you, Christina. Um, it's, uh, it's gonna circle us back to our single parents. Um, and I know that this is a question that keeps me up at night. Um, luckily my son is too young to think about this, but um, how can single parents approach the topic of what might happen and where their children might go should their parents become sick? Um, Preteens, teens, children that are old enough to understand um, the seriousness of COVID are worried about this. Um, and it feels, to a lot of people like a very tough conversation to have and almost like discussing grief and loss before it even happens. Um, do you have any advice on having these conversations with, with your kids? Yeah, and I, I'm sensitive to the fact that in some ways it may depend kind of on your family culture mm -hmm. around loss and death. There are some, it's important to realize that many people and most people are living through COVID. So let's, I want to kind of calm them. You can't necessarily calm them, but let them have that information, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's a good chance that I'm going to be here. So let's, let's affirm that is the language that I would use because I want to be here to stop you from dating. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> so we that were, is very effective right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to try to affirm the things that we want, right? But the reality is, I've mentioned that it comes down to family culture around grief and dying because every family talks about that stuff so differently. 
So I'm very sensitive to it. Some people grew up with their parents saying, grandparents saying things like, okay, see you later, grandma. And grandma would say, if I live, it's like, why are you talking about that? Why are you doing that? <laughs> Whereas other people have a very um, conservative or more hush kind of value and culture around that for any number of reasons. So I want to kind of evaluate what your family culture is around this. In terms of kids who are maybe preteen and older, it's a great opportunity to maybe talk about some things that we would clear, well, some families would not necessarily be talking about in terms of what are our options? You know, who would you, who would you want? Not that this would, would occur the way you want it as a child, but what are some options? Who are some people that I trust? Who are people that you trust? And then there's level of sickness, right? There's a positive test versus going to the hospital versus potentially dying, right? And so those are all to me different stages that we'd wanna be mindful of. So if it's a family that's very conservative, we have to realize, well, first of all, if I tested positive, I might not be able to send you anywhere because now you've been exposed. So we probably are gonna be here together more, you know? Um, but if it gets to the situation where I'm really sick and maybe I need to go to the hospital, then what are our options there? And where can you go where you can stay quarantined and not expose other people? That would be hard on all of us. And that idea is scary to me, but I appreciate you asking the question. So that means that we need to talk about it because it's because it's important enough for you to ask the question, then you're probably ready to hear some answers that I might not have been ready to talk about, but let's go, let's, let's go there. If the question has been posed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's hard, yeah. Um, so we have time for one last question. Um, and this is kind of, I'm going to um, ask, I'm going to keep going with Christina and then we'll circle back to Jack. Um, and if Amanda and Lindsay want to chime in, um, they can feel free. But um, what is one piece of advice you'd give to single parents or those trying to navigate co-parenting right now? Um, if you could just give one piece of advice, what would you give? And I'll start with you, Christina. I think that um, it's kind of like old wisdom from someone I knew named um, Ethel Royce. And she would just say, trust and understanding like is a fundamental ingredient for all relationships. And when we are operating from such a place of fear right now, let's lean in on that and that I trust you to love our child if we're talking about co-parenting. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna trust that and I wanna understand that we're different. So that's kind of a general approach that I think can help parenting is that I know that you have their best interests at heart, best can be defined differently from each of us. Um, but for single parents I, who, who may not have a traditional co-parenting support system, I would, I would lean in on that idea of take that time for yourself, kind of put your mask on, which means a lot now first, mm -hmm. um, and lean on that village because this is not something you have to experience in isolation, though you oftentimes feel very isolated possibly. Jack? Well, well, for the co-parents that I would, uh, I would emphasize conflict management skills that it's hard, it's because talking about safety is such a subjective thing and there's no, you know, there's certain, it, it, that it can become frustrating to hear what your partner is saying or what their attitude is and so forth. And so it's easy for the conflict to emerge and that to then to practice, but then to manage it so that it doesn't escalate, I think requires a tremendous amount of skill. So it's you know, managing the conversation and uh, uh, not letting it jump around and, and not letting, um, if the other person escalates, you don't go up with them. You just have to somehow endure it and bring it down or if you need to say, hey, let's, it seems like we're at a point where we need to adjourn this conversation for a while. Let's, let's pick it up again tomorrow, that kind of a thing. So I think that that's critical because you just have to stay at the negotiating table <clears throat> until you can find some creative solution. So if it's somebody who's not being transparent about things, just say, you know, just try and make it not punitive for them. So that if you get angry and upset, 
that's going to make it harder for them to be more transparent. But just ask the specific questions and say, I just appreciate an honest answer, just so I know what the child's been exposed to. I'm not, I don't want to pass judgment. If I say anything that sounds judgmental, please correct me. For single parents, it's the same thing. I just can't imagine dealing with the exhaustion and the feeling of over, the kind of waves of being overwhelmed. It must come time and time again. And so I think it's got to be a combination of reaching out to other people to find creative solutions, to find support, and then using those little moments to uh, you know, rest and recuperate and restore oneself as best they can. Um, Amanda and Lindsay, you are both um, experienced parents. Um, you have five children across the two of you. No, you don't share five children, but um, do you have any, have any advice? <laughs> Just general kind of, you know, um, words of wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, th this has been such a, a helpful conversation. I, I've learned a ton from it. And so some of the things I was just sort of thinking about to, to take away and, and have parents take away. So whether you're co-parenting or single parenting, at the end of the day, this is something for those of you who've joined us before, you've heard us say a lot, kids need to feel safe and loved. That is the most important fundamental thing that they need to feel. And so, you know, whatever the dynamics are, like keeping that at the forefront as your goal is, does my child feel safe and loved? And, and so are we creating a space across households or, you know, in the way that I am taking care of my child right now that they feel safe and loved? And, and in order to do that, they can get their buckets filled from different people. Like I, as a single parent, don't have to fill all of the buckets by myself. And in fact, it's better for my child if other people are helping fill those buckets in different ways, whether that's just, you know, the silly uncle who, you know, zooms in with them and reads them fun stories or your best friend who can, you know, chat with your adolescent because they think that your best friend is so much cooler than you and they might talk to that person more than you. So just think about like, are there other ways I can help my child get his or her bucket filled that don't have to, to always be me? And when it comes to sort of the conflict, it was just, you know, it was making me think as both Jack and Christina were talking about negotiating these, these, um, these systems and these dynamics. Like my husband said to me at one point years ago in, in the heart of a really awful conflict we were having, I can't be your teammate and your punching bag at the same time. And it was just something that always stayed with me that when you're thinking about these co-parenting dynamics, like we need to be on the same team. We are on team, our child. And so as, as Jack was sort of saying, to think about this as a business partnership or a teammate arrangement, like you cannot be on the same team when you're each other's punching bags too. And so mm -hmm. stepping out of that as best you can to really think about how can we get our child's buckets filled in these different ways? And how can we navigate that either together in the co-parenting context or as a single parent, how can I pull in my village, even virtually, to help my child get their buckets filled? And then I'm awesome. going to let that. Lindsay chime in if she has any advice and then let her bring us home because we are right at 10 o'clock. So, yeah, so I, I just love what Amanda was saying in that quote from her husband. That's fantastic. Um, I just am saying that I, I honestly learned a lot tonight. Like I have a, a co-parent who lives in the same home and I feel like I can put a lot of these strategies uh, to work and deal with some of our challenges that we've had because, you know, there have been lots of them. Um, and I, I just, I guess I don't really have advice. I just want to say that this whole time that this has been going on, I keep thinking about single parents and parents who are doing this on their own. And I just want to say that, you know, you have been on my mind, like in my thoughts. And, you know, when I get overwhelmed, I just think how, how are our people who are doing this on their own? Like, how are they coping? Like that is honestly just incredible. So just giving some, some credit and some, um, I don't know, some positive reinforcement and saying, you know, I'm really in awe of all that you're um, doing during this because even having a very active co-parent lives in the home, it's been, you know, a real, a real challenge. So Hopefully some of this advice has been helpful and you can um, expand that virtual village and, and have people in your life that can help you. I just, I think we should wrap up because we're a few minutes over and I know it's late, um, but I wanna say thank you so much to Christina and Jack for sharing all of your amazing insights, advice, 
resources. Um, this was really great. We had so many great questions coming in. I'm just kind of, I'm sad we can't get to them all, but I really appreciate the questions that are coming in from the audience and let us know what you thought. Um, Victoria popped the feedback link into the chat. Um, so you can hopefully um, have a look at that and it just takes a few minutes or maybe eight minutes, fill it out. I want to thank our partners, Division 53 of the American Psychological Association, Zoo Lily, our content partner, um, one of the best things that you can do um, is to help us by sharing the website, sharing the free resources with others, with other parents, caregivers, um, people in your lives um, that care for kids. You can also support us by making a contribution if you like or having your organization or an organization that you know of partner with us to sponsor a webinar. Um, so Amanda and I, we always say, we always talk about how we donate our time to pandemic parenting. Um, but we have uh, Victoria and other people doing excellent work behind the scenes and making this all happen. And so your contribution goes directly to support them so we can keep doing this because the pandemic doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon, unfortunately. So um, we have um, Giving Tuesday coming up next Tuesday. So um, we have a link there that Victoria just shared for making a contribution if, um, if you would like. You can find all of our webinars, resources, everything um, on our website, pandemic hyphen, or is it a dash? I don't know, pandemic-parent-org. Um, our recording of this session will be up in a couple of days. Um, so um, make sure that you um, check the site for that. And if you sign up on our mailing list, we'll automatically send it to you. Our next webinar is, um, on Thursday, December 3rd, and it's on the positives and negatives of screen time during a pandemic. So mm -hmm. screen time has been like such a hot topic this whole um, entire time. And uh, we went and found speakers who would tell us that all the screen time all the time is the best solution. I'm just kidding. Um, we found some, <laughs> we have some really great people who will be joining us to that to really get into um, the upsides and the downsides of screen time. And we hope that will be another really informative session. So thank you so much for, for um, to our speakers, to everybody. Um, and hopefully we'll see you in about two weeks.